Welcome to the Krishna Das Pilgrim Heart Hour. In this podcast, Krishna Das shares his warm-hearted and down-to-earth path to the divine. If you are interested in supporting Krishna Das's podcast, please go to beherenownetwork.com slash kd. Hare Ram. Okay. What would have happened if I hadn't met Maharaji? Uh, the rest of the question doesn't have anything to do with the first part of the question. If I hadn't met Maharaji, we wouldn't be here today. I'd have been buried a long time ago and you'd be off doing something else. I wouldn't have made it, no question about it. I didn't have it. I didn't have the tools. I didn't have the tools to make it. So being with him and and uh, even hearing about him changed my life long before I met him physically. So uh, that's the answer to that question. The rest of the question is, I try to chant and be aware as much as I can. There's a longing that just remains unquenched. Thank God. The longing is what saves us. Don't fight the longing. The longing is is what's pulling you out of your stuff and leading you into real love. Because that longing will never be quenched until we know who we are. And we are real love. So don't, don't be angry at the longing. Get into it. Merge with it. Absorb it. Relish in it. Revel in it. That's the saving grace. <clears throat> I heard it said that the way humans experience being pulled out of themselves and into God, they experience it as a longing. So that longing is actually the saving grace. What were Maharaji's views on death and afterlife? I don't know. <laughs> You got to understand, he didn't talk about those things much. Every once in a while, he would uh, say a few words in response to somebody who was there. One time, uh, he and Mr. Tuari were on a roof of the temple somewhere. And all of a sudden, Maharaji started dancing around in ecstasy. And he said, oh... So-and-so, this woman, this lady who served him for many, many years had just died. And he knew that, apparently. So he's seeing, oh, she's gone, she's gone, oh. this, And he's like, so Tuari, who had a very special relationship, started yelling at him. And said, you, you butcher, this woman served you for 30, 40 years, and this is what you do? You dance when she leaves the body? And Maharaji looked at Tuari and he said, what? You want me to act like a puppet, like you? Like one of the puppets, like you? So obviously, he was not uh, fooled by appearances of coming and going and of dying and leaving the body. And as Bob Thurman says, there are no dead beings. Beings leave bodies when they wear them out, when their karma is finished with that body. But the being, or the soul, if you want to talk it from the Hindu side, is eternal. There's no death there. But we are identified with bodies, you and me. And so when someone dies, we feel that. We miss them, which is human, and it's okay. But even when you miss somebody, you can still recognize, possibly, that they haven't gone anywhere. So, you know that old country song, uh, How can I miss you when you won't go away? So, it's like that. But we are attached to the body and the emotions and the thoughts and the stories we tell us ourselves about ourselves, and so we suffer from those attachments and those identifications. When 
And if we ever get to the place where we identify with the soul, then there's no death. Then taking, the, then leaving a body is like taking off a changing a suit of clothes. At least that's what they say. Uh, I don't know. We'll see. Hi. The last time I turned tuned in, I heard you mention that after Maharaji passed, you quit wearing red for several years. Would you consider sharing why or why you decided to go back to the devotional colors? Well, they weren't necessarily devotional colors, but he, he told me to wear red because it was Hanuman's color. So I wore red for a long time. Whoops. The light. And, um, but I was very depressed. Uh, <laughs> very depressed that he'd gone away and left me. And uh, at that point, all my shit came back, all my horrible, neurotic, self-destructive tendencies got very happy and started showing up. And so I, I kind of uh, left that trip for a while and didn't think about things like that. Although, I, in my mind, I was with Maharaji, but my emotions were very, very uh, dark, and they weren't letting a lot of light in for a long time. A long time. So, and then at some point I said, Krishnadas, you're such an asshole. Put on the red shirts or shut up. And that's what I did. Do I give harmonium lessons? God forbid. Do you have any recommendations on where to go for them? No. So, actually, uh, I don't... I, I play harmonium, which is an instrument that's used in India, but I play it in a very Western way. I don't play it like they play it in India. And if you go to an Indian person to learn harmonium, they're going to teach you the Indian scales and the whole the music theory of Raga, which is extraordinarily beautiful, very beautiful. And it's, if not a lifetime study, it's many years study. Uh, if all you want to do is play harmonium along with some chanting or some other kind of music, you can take piano lessons because the harmonium is essentially the same keyboard as a piano. So, uh, yeah, but also online, we have on my website videos of me playing a whole bunch of my chants because I play them weird. I, I, you know, I finger them in a different than you might imagine trying to figure it out yourself. So those are up there. Uh, they're not free, but they're up there. And um, they're called the Harmonium Tutorials. That's as close as I get to teaching anything about a harmonium. A lot of questions tonight. Nobody really knows much about Maharaji's uh, past, what practices he did. Uh, we don't really know much about his guru. He never talked about those things. It was a very extraordinary and different kind of situation. It wasn't linear, like he got something from someone, then he passed it on to someone. It wasn't like that. It wasn't that traditional form. It was very uh, agora, which means beyond the norms, the normal traditional forms. Uh, there's no question that he had a guru at some point, but we don't know when that was, because we don't know how old he was. There are stories that would make it seem, if you believe them, that he's he was over hundreds of years old. So, on the other hand, we seem to know where he was born and who his parents were. So it's very, there's no way the mind can 
can take in who he is and what he is. Uh, because I believe all the stories. <laughs> and I believe them because they're probably true. Uh, there are a lot of things that happened that were beyond explaining. So... When did I learn about Hanuman? Well, I, I learned about Hanuman after Ramdas came back from India the first time and I met Ramdas. He gave me uh, the Tulsi Das Ramayana to read. And that's when I learned about Hanuman. And then, of course, when I went to India, all of Maharaji's temples were primarily Hanuman temples. So we started to learn more about Hanuman and we also read the Ramayana again and again and, you know, heard stories and began to absorb more information about Hanuman and the practices and the lineage of Dasya Bhava, the servant, the feeling of service to, the, to God, to the One. I'm so curious who the man is in the portraits left and right of KD. He's bald with some facial hair. Me? Left and right. You mean, what do you mean? Maharaji? Left and right. You mean this one and this one? That's Maharaji. I don't know if that's what you mean, but any, who are the bald guys that are around here? Well, there's a few, but I don't think you can see them. Uh, I don't think, can they see Maharaji? Yeah, it's Maharaji. That's Neem Karoli Baba, my guru. Welcome to the club. Is chanting to Ma same as Ram or Krishna or Shiva? Absolutely. These are all the names of that one that takes all these different shapes and forms. It's the chanting that's important, not so much who you think you're chanting to. That itself is just a, well, not just, the forms of the deities, of the great beings like that, they are there to, to help us move in that direction, to, to, to inspire our love and devotion. But their essence is exactly the same as each of them, and even the same as our essence. The, 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 the Buddha nature or the soul, our, our true being, is the same as every being in the universe. We're all part of that same being. So sometimes you feel like a nut, sometimes you don't. That's You chant to who you feel like chanting. But remember, it's about your experience. It's not about something outside of yourself necessarily, although... In, at our stage, we really believe that those beings are outside of us. And so we should respect where we are you know, on the path and how we feel about it. Don't try to talk yourself into some kind of uh, fake, blind faith about things. You have to have the experience yourself. So the most important thing is doing the practice. It doesn't really matter ultimately who you're singing to, who you think you're singing to, because that's just uh, an apparition to get your attention to some degree. A beautiful apparition that I wouldn't change for anything in the world, but still. Do I think that martial arts have a place for us on the path? Absolutely. The question is, or the situation is that many times they're misused for aggressive, angry uh, behavior, egocentric, aggressive behavior, to hurt, to conquer. So that's not useful. But the true martial arts, the essence of true martial arts is contacting a, di a deeper place within. And certainly Aikido, Tai Chi, and 
uh, that type of thing, those are very so-called spiritual martial arts. Uh, the other ones tend to uh, attract people who have a lot of anger and a lot of aggression and or a lot of fear that they want to protect themselves, which is the other side of aggression. So they tend to, uh, they, they could possibly uh, create more suffering for the, the people who practice them themselves, but not necessarily. All these practices come from deeper place. Can chanting help to break through the delusions of life? But what do you think? That's exactly what all these practices are for. We, the number one cause of suffering is ignorance or delusion. Of taking the rope that you see to be a snake and then acting as if it's a snake, when it's only a rope, but you think it's a snake, so you you get fear, and then you want to kill it or run or something. Because we see things in a certain way, we act in response to the way we perceive the universe and perceive ourselves. Mostly it's very deluded and ignorant. It's not accurate, let's put it that way. We don't see our true nature. We don't see the true nature of the world around us. And so everything we do is just, in some sense, getting us deeper and deeper into the quicksand of delusion. Chanting and other spiritual practices are the cure, the medicine for that particular type of delusion, delusive disease subjective reality, which is not accurate. Subjective, it's a projection that we do. So through these practices, our projections get thinner and thinner and more transparent until we see things the way they really are, which is supposed to be wonderful. <laughs> we'll see, I guess. What got me out of my depressed state? Maybe tomorrow. <laughs> you know, I don't know if it's depression, but you know, I still feel like I'm the same schmuck I've always been. I mean, maybe I don't think it as much of the time, maybe. But my basic feeling about who I am, when I think about that, when, when those thoughts are arising, those are the same thoughts that have been there since I was a kid. And when I'm stuck in those thoughts, things seem to be just the same. I seem to be unable to do anything to help myself. And it's always going to be like that. And nothing I can do about it. But then those thoughts disappear. And I'm not thinking that about myself. This comes from practice. This is what practice does. Every time we come back to the sound of the name or the mantra that we're doing, we've let go of the thoughts about ourselves and the stories about ourselves that we believe. And if we've let go of them, then we're not thinking them. And then we're here with Ram or Shiva or whatever. Then the next thing we know, we're caught again. And we realize we've been lost in thought. So we come back again, constantly forgetting and remembering, forgetting, remembering. And the practice is to remember. So every time you come back to the chant, Over time, the feeling of being, of what being back means, which means being here, here and now. Be 
here, now. You ever hear that? Being here, now. That feeling becomes more familiar. And actually, that's where we live. But we're pulled out of that place by our stuff. And most people spend a whole lifetimes out of it, out of not aware of their true nature. Most of us. So, as we do these practices, little by little, we get more familiar with being just, just being here. And we're not thinking like, wow, I'm really feeling like I'm here now. This is fantastic. I'm so here. It's incredible. No. When a kid is playing, there's no meta story going on like, wow, I'm really playing. How cool am I? Right? No. They're just in it. So when you're not thinking about it, and not stuck and glued to your thoughts and evaluations and judgmental mind and all the other stuff. When that's not happening, you're just here, but you're not aware of it yet. So as we keep coming back again and again and again, that awareness starts to percolate. We become aware of that, of our true self. Or so they say. My husband of 53 years just died of COVID. Yeah, I'm very sorry to hear that. Very painful. So many people are suffering now. It's unbelievable. So I wish you all the best and him all the best on his journey. And uh, the love never dies. The bodies may not be around to talk to, but the love is here and the love never dies. But our emotions prevent us from feeling that. So we have to let go. Those emotions will calm down over time and the love will still be here. It'll always be here because we're here. That's where it is. Did I know Bo Lozoff and his wife Sita? Yes, I knew Bo very well, and I know Sita. Bo died some years ago. Bo was the first one who took me to sing in the prisons. That was the first prison we went to. It was down in, uh, it was in Virginia. So yes, I knew Bo for a long time. Is there a way to open third eyes by chanting? Two eyes are enough, man. Take it easy. You wouldn't know what to do with a third eye. Just use the two you got to see love everywhere. Don't worry about anything else like that. That's, that's the advanced course. None of us are ready for that. So just calm yourself. Use your two eyes in a good way. How does one discern from an inner knowing and the, the neurotic mind, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Well, I don't know. Only you know. Uh, it's not like something's talking to you inside. It's a feeling about what you want to do or what you think you should do. And uh, the way you learn is you trust those feelings. And if you hit a wall, then you go try to find a way around it. There's no guarantees that everything's going to work out the way you want it to work out. But if you don't trust yourself, then what do you have? Let's look at it that way. You have nothing. So the whole path is to learn to trust oneself 
and and to learn how to treat other people the way you, the way we want to be treated. If we could treat other people the way we want to be treated, this whole world would immediately be different. But people don't do that. People want this and want that, and they're greedy and angry and selfish and fearful and hurt and shameful. So we treat ourselves and other people very badly. So listen to your heart, your intuition about what you feel you need to do in life and try to do it. If it doesn't work out, try something else. Keep listening. If it's not working out, then you know it. Just the same way you knew that you wanted to do it. So when you're doing a lot of practice, you're you're releasing a lot of uh, self-referential desires and thoughts and emotions, self, small as self. And so your vision, your inner vision is clearing up a little bit because from the practice. And so uh, one tries to listen to oneself about what's right and wrong for oneself in the context of the kind of life you have. You may want to go live in a cave, but if you're married and you have a family, that might not be the best thing to do. So wanting doesn't mean doing. I'm not saying to do whatever you want. I'm saying do what you feel is the right thing for you to do. It's not easy to figure that out. So take your time and see what happens. And if it felt right today and doesn't feel right tomorrow, then stop. You have to listen to yourself. We have to listen to ourselves. I am stuck between Hare Krishna and Jay Hanuman. That's the best place in the world to be stuck. I wish I was stuck there. Come on. Just the name. You don't have to pick one. They're all the same. They're all your your own true nature. Sometimes you feel like a nut. Sometimes you don't. It doesn't matter. Don't make such a big deal about it. I have to pick this. I have to pick that. Just sing and be a good person. It's very simple. All, any one of these names will take you all the way home. They're all the names of our own true self, our soul, which is no different than the soul of every other being in the universe. So it's not a game. It's not playing with dollies. These names carry strength and, and powerful, positive energy and love which will cure us of our self-centered selfishness and all the pain and suffering that we have this is the world of broken hearts this is this is the way it is here all of our hearts have been crushed so we need to find a deeper part of that heart that that cannot be crushed and never will be and never has been. And all these names lead to that place. Do you have any advice about handling differences of opinion within extended family about the virus? Seems especially difficult right now with the holidays. Well, it's difficult right now, period between the social unrest and the virus and, and the lack of, uh, of jobs for people and the fact that we're, most of us are locked up 
in, inside the walls of a small place and bouncing off the walls and our, and our thoughts are devouring us all day long and everything is magnified and intensified and, and it's a hard time for everybody's acting out. Everybody gets angrier, a thousand times angrier than they would have got in a normal situation. A thousand times angrier, a thousand times more depressed, a thousand times more selfish, a thousand times very hard to be a thousand point, a thousand times nicer and kinder in these times. Very difficult because all our stuff is eating us alive. And on one hand, that's actually very useful. As if we're doing practice, the enemy is clear our minds. It's only our minds, our stuff, our thoughts. That's all. Just a thought. Now, you mentioned something about different uh, ideas of the virus. Don't get into it. Smile and kiss the person who's expounding about their beliefs. If it's just... Don't get into it. It's not worth it. You'll solve nothing. You'll only make more upset. More. You'll inflame all the emotions. Just let it go. Don't try to prove anything to anybody. Don't try to be right. Because in this world, nobody's right. Everybody's got a point of view. And all the points of view are egocentric. So forget it. Just relax. Let it be. It'll pass. You know, in two or three hundred years, nobody will remember this. Certainly you won't, and certainly I won't. <laughs> so don't get caught in it and create more suffering. Is there a certain tone or note specifically for Om when chanting? Or is it just where your vocal range is? Yeah, it's just where your vocal range is. As far as I know. Uh, you sing where it's natural for you. You don't have to sing. If you're singing in a group, you're going to be following what the group does. But when you're home alone, you sing in your natural range. Uh, there's no particular note that's the real ohm. The real ohm is beyond sound. So... How does one find a guru? One doesn't. Guru finds you when we're ready. And more than ready, the guru finds us and manifests for us in a way that's best for us all the time. Whether you think you have a guru or you think you don't have a guru, that's called thinking. Guru is your own true nature. Guru, God, self. Same, one thing, not different. But self doesn't mean the body. It doesn't mean the ego. It means the real self, the true nature. That's who the guru is. That may manifest and show up outside of you in, in another body. But it's not up to us to find that. That finds us. That happens when time when that would be the most thing, useful for thing to us, for us. A real guru can only do one thing. Serve the love in all beings. They don't do business unless they feel like it. They don't, they don't sell anything unless they feel... They can do whatever they want. But the point is, no matter what they're doing... Their only motivation, true motivation, is to help us because we are completely asleep. Somebody has to wake us up. We fell asleep and didn't set an alarm. And millions of lives have gone by. So, when the Guru is not different than us and never far from us and never away from us, so, start where you are. Yeah. Start with your anger, 
and your shame and your fear and your lust and your grief and work on that stuff. Because then you're uncovering the guru within, the real guru. So don't be looking for something outside. You won't find it. Look within, and a lot of things might show up in your life that you don't expect. So many people are into spells and herbal concoctions these days. <laughs> Can you talk about these compared to mantra and devotion? These names that we sing, they're only good for one thing. That's real love. Curing us of our selfishness and our self-centeredness and our fears and our anger, curing us of all those things. That's what they're good for. They're not spells. They're not, they're not, oh, there's mantras for everything. There's mantras for robbing banks. There's mantras for finding buried treasure. There's mantras for stopping trains. There's mantras for becoming president of the United States. But these not mantras that we do are the name of our own true being, the love that lives within us is who we truly are. So the difference is not only, the difference is mainly in intention and, and uh, application of the, of the practice. So Where is that awesome gold Hanuman from that is behind you? Gold Hanuman. You mean the big Hanuman, right? Up there, yeah. That's that Murti, that Hanuman, that statue, this enlivened statue called a Murti, is in Maharaji's temple in Brindavan in India. And uh, we spent a lot of time in that temple singing and spending time with Maharaji there. And that Hanuman is very dear to me, that, that Murti. So that's where that's from. And that's the way he looked in the summer of 1973. That's when that picture was taken. You know, they have to keep fixing it up and fixing the paint on the face. And so now I think he looks a little different. I haven't been there for a while. But that's the way he looked in 73. Okay. How does transcendental meditation differ from our meditation? I don't know what our meditation is. What's yours? What's mine? I don't even know. Transcendental meditation is a mantra meditation that you're initiated in by uh, Maharishi Mahesh's uh, lineage his uh, teachings, and uh, it's a particular repetition of a mantra. I don't think it's very different than what we do, although in, in that situation, you have to join something and you're, you're initiated and you're given the mantra. Uh, that's a very formal way of doing it. Maharaji didn't do those things. Uh, so... But the practice itself is not that different as far as I can, I, I know, I've never been initiated, so I can't tell you exactly. All right.
सीताराम 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 जय सीताराम
chaque cœur au cours de l'un. À panneté de son maraud à paix, qui n'ont l'occasion que t'en cante. Où te pésache ne cache ne hérave, à vire de bonhomme se nave. Ma séroga et sa papier. Chapatanirantara numatabir Sankatate hanuman churave Anakrama bachana dhyana dolave Abhapararamata pasviraja Tina ke kaja sukal tumasaja Ormanorata dyoko ilave So I meet the dear and the palapave, Chaum Yuga Paratap Patumar, Epperdosid Chagatu Jiyar, Sadhu Santa Ke Marakovar, Surla Nirkandana Ram Dular, Ashtu Siddhi No Nidhi Ke Data. Savardina Chanaki Mat Rama Rasayan Tumare Pas Sadar Hor Bhutati Kedas Tumare Bhajan Rama Kopal Janam Janam Kedukab Sarav Anta Kalara Ubar Pura Jai Jahan Jan Mahar Bhakt Kahai Or Devata Chit Nadarai Anumat Se Isar Sukha Karai Sankat Kate Mirte Sab Pira Osumere Hant Balabir Te Je Je Hanuman Gosai Vakaro Guru Deva Kinai Josata Vada Pakta Karakoi Chute Hibandi Mahasukoi Joya Pare Hanuman Chalisa Oya Siddhi Saki Gharisa Tulasi Dasa Sada Hari Chira Jenata Hode Mahandir Pavantanaya Sankata Harana Mangala Murti Rupsiyana Amalakana Sita Sahita Hode Basa Usura Bhupa Siyavara Ram Chandra Padaje Sharana Mangala Murti Marta Nanda Sakala Mangala Mula Nikanda La Murti Marta Nanda Sakala Mangala Mula Nikanda Shri Ram Jaya Ram Jaya Jaya Ram Shri Ram Jaya Ram Jaya Jaya Ram Okay. Shri Shri Ram Jaya Ram Jaya Jaya Ram Shri Ram Jaya Ram Jaya Jaya Ram Shri Ram Jaya Ram Jaya Jaya Ram Shri Ram Jaya Ram Sitaram, 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 yes, Sitaram. Sitaram, Sitaram, Sitaram.
Sitaram Jai Sitaram Jai Sitaram Jai Baba Hanuman Sankatam Ochanak Pamedhan Sitaram, 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 yes, Sitaram. So, good being with you tonight, chanting. Try to do some practice every day, if it's just a few minutes. Spend a minute letting go. Just let go. Let's try to let go, let it all pass through for a few minutes. It doesn't have to be a formal practice. Just release and then move on. Try to do it a few times during the day. Whenever you remember, just take a breath. <sighs> let it go. Let it leave the body. Let the tension leave. So if we know anything about a path at all, if we know that there might be a way to live in this world in a good way, with an open heart and without fear, it's only because of the great beings that have gone before us on this path. Out of their love, out of their kindness, they left some footprints for us to follow. So, in the same way that they wish for us, in the same way that they wish for us, we wish that all beings everywhere, all of us, be safe, be happy, that all of us have good health and enough to eat. And may we all live in peace and at ease of heart with whatever comes to us in life. Namaste. Be well. Take good care. See you next week. Mm -hmm.